If you have your Bibles this morning, we are continuing in our study in the Gospel of Luke. Uh, Luke chapter 6, this will be the last week that I take you to Luke chapter 6 because we're finishing up the chapter of Luke chapter 6. I hope this has been an encouraging uh, study for you, especially this chapter. We've been walking through uh, a very important sermon uh, of Jesus Christ. It is known as the Sermon on the Mount, uh, Matthew tells us. And we have walked through this sermon and have taken it apart to answer the question, what does it mean to be a follower of Jesus? Or to use our terminology that we like to use here um, at Marquette Community Church is, what does it mean to be a grace point? Those two are synonymous. What does it mean to be a follower of Jesus? And so we've seen several things throughout this message that Jesus has given to us, and they all build upon each other, and he's going to give us the final thing uh, today, and it's a very important point that we need uh, to have today. So I'm glad that you're here, and I'm glad for those who are online with us today. If you recall, Jesus began this sermon with what was known as the Beatitudes. It talked about our heart attitude, and he gave four pros and cons that dealt with what the heart attitude of a follower of Jesus is to be. If you have accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you're a follower of Jesus. And as a follower of Jesus, this should be your heart attitude. Now, we're not perfect in any of this. We have to work in all of these areas. But this is definitely our heart attitude. And that is this, to completely trust God in all things. To desire the spiritual things of God, to be heartbroken over sin in our life and the sin of the world, and to endure hatred for God's sake. So when we have this heart attitude that, God, I'm, I'm going to be sold out to you, I'm going to, I'm going to trust you, I'm going to do what, what you call me to do with spiritual things, I'm going to be serious about sin, and I'm going to serve you no matter what happens, that's the attitude that we are supposed to have as followers of Christ. Of course, the Holy Spirit gives us that uh, heart attitude the second that we are saved and we build upon that. Then we saw that the core value that uh, Jesus has given to us, the core value of our life is godly love. And it's a love that's impartial. It's, it's a love that is, uh, doesn't compromise on the truth. And so as we've seen these two things given into our lives that we as followers of Jesus are supposed to be at the core of who we are, there's three results that come out of that. We looked at two of them already, and that is that we are to have merciful discernment, meaning this, that we as followers of Jesus are to discern, that's judgment, to judge, we are to discern what is right and wrong, and we are to respond to what is right and wrong with grace and mercy. Um, and forgiveness if, if someone has wronged us. So that's how we're to respond to that. But we are to discern what is right or wrong based upon the Word of God. And then last week we looked at that the other result of being a follower of Jesus Christ is that we will, as followers of Jesus Christ, bear fruit. And the fruit that we talked about is the fruit of the Spirit. When we are saved, we receive the fruit of the Spirit. It will pour out of us as we walk with the Lord and as we draw closer to Him. And we are to see the evidences of that fruit in our lives. As a genuine follower of Jesus Christ, these things will be at the core of who we are. And these things will take place in our lives. And so Jesus now brings us to the third result. And it's very important because really Jesus comes now towards the end and he lays a foundation, and you'll see that even literally in what he's going to show us here, that really brings us to the how all of this works together and is fulfilled in our lives as followers of Jesus. Let me ask you this question though. Do you like to be successful? Do you? I have never met anyone who has said, I want to fail at everything I do in my life. I've never found anybody to say that. I found people that have accomplished that, but, but I've never found anybody to actually uh, say that in their life. All of us want to succeed, and I hope you desire to be successful in your life. But let me ask you, have you ever had this scenario happen in your life, this, this situation now here's the truth of the matter. Every single one of us has expertise in certain areas of our lives. There are things that you are good at, things that I'm good at, things that we would fall into the category of having expertise in, right? And so let's say you have expertise in being uh, in mechanics and fixing mechanical things or cars or whatever, and you hear your friend talking. 
And when you hear your friend talking, he's talking about a mechanical problem that he has. And you have already fixed that type of mechanical problem uh, in a car. And so you know how to fix that. You know what it is. And as he's talking about it, you actually have the skill and the expertise to help him to fix that faster than what he ever thought he could and cheaper than he ever thought he could. And so you go to him, he's your friend, and you tell your friend, you say, listen, I've had the same exact problem with my car. I know exactly how to fix it. This is exactly what you do, point one, point two, point three. You do these things in this order, and, and you do this, and you will uh, fix your car, and it will be cheaper than you ever thought you were. It, it could be. All right, And your friend's like, great, thank you so very much. I'm glad you gave me this information. This is wonderful. And then you check with your friend the next week and you find out that your friend did nothing you told him. Have you ever had an experience like that? You gave him everything he needed to have and he did nothing you told him. As a matter of fact, he made the problem ten times worse. It's going to cost him three times more to get it fixed. And it's bigger than what he ever imagined. Have you ever just, whatever circumstance that's in, have you ever given some advice, some expertise to someone that you knew would help them and they didn't follow it at all? Well, whether you said it out loud or not, you asked this question, Why didn't you listen to me? Right? You may not have said that to him. You may have said it to him. But you at least said it in your mind. Why? And and how do you come out of that circumstance? You come out a little bit frustrated, don't you? Why? Because you knew the answer. You knew it would work. You did it before. You knew it would be the right thing. You knew beyond a shadow of a doubt that if they would have followed these simple steps, if they would have just, you ready for the word? Obeyed. They would have just obeyed what I told them. You ever think the Lord feels that way? You ever think the Lord kind of looks and, and, and feels a little bit like, I've got it all planned out for you. I've given you my word. I've, I've given you all the principles. I've given you all the stuff. And why don't you listen? Well, can I tell you something? I know exactly the fact that Jesus does feel that way. Because look at verse number 46. (laughs) Jesus speaking comes to the end of his message and he says these words, Why? Why do you call me Lord, Lord and not do what I tell you? If you would just listen to me. Now, we read this and... And Lord is not a term that we use much anymore. It used to be in Old English, used to be used and stuff like that. And we've, I think we've kind of gotten away in our Christian circles from what the word Lord actually means. We think of it as a, a term of endearment maybe to God. And, uh, you know, it's a term that we use for Lord. But the word Lord here and this word here, this Greek word as it is translated, are you ready? Means master. All right. Means master. Master. So what literally Jesus is saying is, you're a follower of me. You've accepted me as Lord and Savior. You've decided to follow me. You're going to follow what I teach, what I do. You're going to follow the principles of what I give to you. As a matter of fact, you have actually called me Master. And as your Master, why don't you do what I tell you? Why don't you listen to what I say. Now the truth of the matter is we're all, we've all been there. We've all experienced this in our lives. We've all had experiences in our lives that if I would have just listened, I wouldn't be in this and stuff like that. But Jesus is coming now to this as a follower of Jesus. Now remember our context. As a follower of Jesus, we're making Jesus our master. As a matter of fact, that's really what it means to make Jesus Lord. You know, when we share the good news of Jesus Christ, we walk over to Romans chapter 10, verses 9 and 10. It says, if you will confess with your mouth that Jesus is what? Lord. That Greek word is the same, that Jesus is master. I am, when I accepted Jesus as my Lord and Savior, I'm saying, Jesus, you're master. You know all. You've given all. You you are who I am going to follow all the time. You're my master. Master. As a matter of fact, this term is so very, very uh, important to us because Paul actually uses a different term for us as followers of Jesus Christ, synonymous for us being followers of Jesus Christ. He calls us bond servant. A bond servant is a servant who has been uh, bound into servanthood, or we would use the term a slave. 
Now, when you look at the terminology of a slave, we understand the definition of that means that we have no rights, we have no uh, ability on our own to go outside of what Jesus, our master, has for us. So when it comes to our obedience, Jesus is setting the scene here that we are to obey as slaves. Now, why is Jesus setting this up this way? The reason why he's setting this up is not because Jesus wants to lord it over you, which he has the right to do, doesn't he? He is the master of the universe. He has the right to say, listen, I, you will do what I say. I will make you do what I say. But Jesus doesn't do that. Jesus says, I am master, and I want you to do what I say. I'm not going to force you, but I'm telling you the best thing for you to do is to obey because what I know and what I have is what is best for your life. Not only is Jesus our master, but we also have a heavenly father who loves us with so much grace, mercy. And what he's saying here is that when we follow what Jesus has, when we are obedient to what Jesus has given to us, when we are obedient to the word of God and we follow the principles uh, that is given to us, the outcome for us is this, is positive. Now, it doesn't mean all of our circumstances will be positive. How many of you have obeyed the Lord, but the world has come against you because of it, right? We experience that. Uh, but the reality is, is that in the scheme of what Jesus has for us, even though things can be rough, when we obey what God has for us, the outcome for us is always positive in our lives. Not easy, but positive. When we don't follow Jesus... The outcome is disastrous. And so Jesus gives us two word pictures, if you will, two little stories here. And all of us, I think, have probably heard them, but it's so very, very important. And Jesus says this, listen, why do you call me master, not obey? But look what he says here. He says, but let me say this in verse 47 and 48. Everyone who comes to me and hears my words... And I don't know if you have your Bible open or if you underline in your Bible, but would you underline these two words, and does them, right? Everyone who hears my words and does them, I will show you what he is like. He is like a man building a house who dug deep and laid the foundation on the rock. And when a flood arose, the stream broke against the house and could not shake it because it had been well built, been put on the foundation of a rock. Listen, everyone who hears and does. How many times have I said to you, you probably said too many for me to remember because pastor you say this all the time, that just hearing the word of God and not doing the word of God is worthless, right? You can hear it all you want, you can listen to it all you want, you can memorize it, you can have it in your life, but if you don't ever apply it, it's worthless, those aren't my words. I, I know I sounded smart when I said them, right? And I like to take credit, but those are Jesus' words. Jesus himself says this right here. You think, you know, I get this from Jesus, right? Those who hear my words and do them. Not only will things go right, but look at this. You will be on a firm foundation, on a solid rock. You know who that rock is? That rock is Jesus. Your foundation is Jesus Christ. And if your foundation is Jesus Christ, guess what? When the storms of life come, and, and Jesus is laying this on thick, he says the, the rains come and it starts to flood, and it floods so much that the river overflows, that, that it goes over its banks, that the, the river actually breaks up and the waters are so strong, and the waters come against the house, and the very second they hit the house, the house stands firm, doesn't even shake, doesn't even move. The waters just come around and push on it, and it's on such a firm foundation that it doesn't move at all. That no matter what is coming, no matter what storms are being faced, no matter what happens, it's on a firm foundation. Those who hear and do, those who hear and obey, those who hear the Word of God, read the Word of God, apply the Word of God, follow the principles of the Word of God, because Jesus is the Word, is He not? When we apply those to our lives, no matter what we walk through, and isn't this, 
Isn't it great in God's providence where he puts things? I mean, come on, are we not in the most tumultuous time of our lives? How many of you are like praying for uh, 2021 to show up quick, right? Can we just cut this year off and, and move on, right? But how do we weather all of this? How do we get through all of this? We get through it by being on the foundation of Jesus Christ. Can I be real with you this morning? I want you to know that the things that are happening in our society today, the, the, the things that are happening with the coronavirus, the things that are happening with the rioting, the things that, and the decisions that we have to make as church leaders and stuff like that, they weigh on me heavily. It, it's a struggle. It, in my, if I give into my emotions, I can be down as down as down can be and, and be frustrated. But I have to continually bring myself back to the fact that God is in control. That, that Jesus is my foundation. And when I stay on the foundation and when I read the word of God, that, that G- God says I, nothing's happening that I don't know about. Nothing's happening that, that I haven't already seen. Nothing is happening that I, I haven't already allowed. When I, when I come to that, I'm strengthened. I'm encouraged. I can stand. That's the foundation that we have in Jesus. But Jesus goes on and says this in verse number 49. He says, but... The one who hears and does not do. So they hear, right? They they know. They've heard the principles. They've heard the, the message. They've heard the truth. But they don't do it. It's like a man who built his house on the ground. Didn't dig down for a foundation. No foundation on the house. Just put it on the ground. Some translations may say sand. And when the storm broke against it, same exact storm. Same exact rain, same exact flood, same exact everything. The second it hit the house, it crumbled. Instantaneously crumbled. Whoever hears and does not do. So let me give you a phrase that maybe you've heard before. Simply hearing and knowing the words of Jesus is worthless. Simply hearing and knowing the words of Jesus is worthless. You have to apply them. You have to live them out. And I want you to see that this house is so weak that it immediately fell. The second the water hit the house, it would not stand. The littlest of storms for the person that hears, for the person that knows, but doesn't do, doesn't apply the truths of God's life, Anything that comes into their life, they fall to pieces. I'm sure many of you know folks this way. The littlest thing comes in and they're completely overwhelmed by it. So as a follower of Jesus, you know that Jesus knows all. And that his intentions are always the best for you. Do you not? Jesus knows all, and Jesus always wants the best for you. And so Jesus asks this question, then why don't you listen? Then why don't you listen? Now, I don't think Jesus, in in making this statement, is tearing us down or beating us up. I think Jesus is trying to get us to get into a routine of reminding ourselves that we need to continually go back to the rock, (laughs) continually go back to the foundation because listen there are times in my life where my feelings overwhelm and I forget ever happened to you and I start looking at the circumstances and then I have to remember oh yeah my foundation isn't in politics my foundation isn't in medicine my foundation isn't in all of this stuff my foundation is in Jesus Christ he knows and he knows what is the best And so I believe that Jesus concludes with this to bring us back to really even the beginning of this, to to book in this message. And so Jesus says, and what he's saying here is the successful follower of Jesus. You want to be a successful follower of Jesus. You want to live the life that Jesus has called you to live, to live successfully. That in order for you to be a successful follower of Jesus, you have to have the right attitude that you're going to trust God desire spiritual things, be heartbroken over sin, endure hatred for God's sake, that you're going to have a love that is above and beyond what the world has, this godly love, 
that you're going to determine what is right or wrong through God's word, show grace, mercy, and forgiveness, that you're going to bear the fruit of the Spirit, and that you're going to obey the Lord in everything you do. And the person that does that, continually strives in that, continually comes back to that, will waver, will sin, will get away at times in this life because we live in this body of flesh, but every time we come, get up and every time we come back, we're successful. We're successful. As we continue to walk in this, we are successful. Years ago, a farmer owned land along the Atlantic seacoast. He constantly advertised for hired hands, but most people were reluctant to work on the farm along the Atlantic. They dreaded the awful storms that raged across the Atlantic, wreaking havoc on the buildings and the crops. And so, as the farmer interviewed applicants for the job, he received a steady stream of refusals until one day, a short, thin man, well past middle age, approached the farmer. And the farmer asked him, are you a good farmhand? And he, the, he, asked, uh, he answered him, well, I can sleep when the wind blows. Although puzzled by the answer, the farmer, desperate for help, hired him. And the little man worked well around the farm, busy from dawn to dusk, and the farmer felt satisfied with the man's work. And then one night, the storm came. The winds started to blow from off the shore, and one of those storms was coming off the Atlantic Ocean and jumping out of bed. The farmer grabbed the lantern and rushed next door to the hired hand sleeping quarters, and he shook the little man and yelled, Get up! A storm is coming! We have to tie down uh, before everything is blown away. <laughs> and the little man just looked at him, rolled over, and firmly said, No, sir, I told you. I can sleep when the wind blows. The farm uh, man was so enraged. He's like, I was, I, 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 he was tempted to fire him on the spot. Instead, he hurried out to prepare for the storm. And to his amazement, he discovered that all the haystacks had been covered with tarps. The cows were in the barn. The chickens were in the coop. The doors were barred. The shutters were tightly secured. Everything was tied down and nothing could blow away. And the farmer then understood what his hired hand meant when he said that he could sleep when the wind blows and return to bed to also sleep while the wind blew. Can you sleep when the wind blows? When you live in obedience to Jesus, you will experience great success in your life as his follower. And when the storms of life come, you will weather them victoriously. So can I leave you with this last statement? Obedience to Jesus always brings success. Always. And as a follower of Jesus... As a follower of Jesus, we need to have the right heart attitude. We need to have the core value. We need to determine what is right and wrong. We need to bear fruit, and we need to live in obedience. And when we do that, church, when we do that, we will be the followers of Jesus that God has called us to be, and we will be successful. Will you stand with me in God's house today? Most gracious Heavenly Father, thank you so much for the truth of your word. Thank you for your love for us, Lord, that we as your followers don't just try to figure things out on our own, but Lord, you have given us a, a decisive plan. You have given us the way of victory. And Lord, I pray that uh, even though we in this body of flesh will get into sin, we will walk away, but we will always come back. We will always come back to these truths, and we'll always come back to obedience. And Lord, would you make us successful, we pray, for your honor, for your glory, and for your kingdom. We ask this all in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Lord bless you. Enjoy the rest of your holiday weekend. You're dismissed. And you can make noise. <laughs> you can talk.
God bless you.